All right, now we're joined by Sandeep Kashik and Holly Miller, who are here for the, uh, the Seattle Quality Preschool Campaign, which is the City Council of uh, Preschool Measure. So go ahead with a five minute introduction. Sure, just very, very quickly introducing ourselves. I'm Sandeep Kashik, and I'm a consultant for the campaign. It is the City of Seattle back measure. I think it's probably everybody around the table knows. Um, not the perfect situation, but we have two uh, competing measures on the ballot um, uh, this November, and so hopefully we can get to have a discussion, have an opportunity to kind of explain the, the differences between the two, and I think make a case for why the 36th should support our country. Holly, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Holly Miller. I'm in the, my working hours, I'm director of the Office for Education in the city, but I'm here as a private citizen. Great, I'll just start off with I don't think in, in this room and, and at the 36, I have to delve too deeply into this, but to, to make the case for uh, creating a, a, a quality preschool, uh, subsidized quality preschool system for kids in Seattle. So we have about 12,000 three and four year old kids in the city of Seattle. The data clearly shows that. Um, too many kids are entering the K-12 system not ready to learn, and the fact that the, the, the data clearly shows that if you don't get to those kids early, their chances of future success, not just in the K-12 system, but future economic success, graduation rates, but then future economic success, uh, is severely constrained. And 25% of kids, by the time they reach the third grade, have fallen behind. Um, it's stark numbers. It's much, much worse for uh, lower income kids, kids of color, uh, and, 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 and it, children from families of, of immigrant families. Uh, it's a really serious problem. Whatever you call it, achievement gap, opportunity gap, it is a significant and persistent problem that we face in the city of Seattle. We lose way too many kids early on. So the idea of this program, I mean, Holly's the expert, really, if you talk about it more and more, when talking about it in the Q&A, is to create a system where the city enters into what is now essentially a private system of preschool. Um, to create some public standards and programs that voluntarily meet those standards and comply with that system will have an opportunity where the, the, the parents and the families entering into that system will get generous subsidies to send their kids into a quality program. So up to, about seven, for a family of four, up to $71,000 a year, I'm sorry, um, uh, those children will have a, a fully subsidized preschool. But the subsidy does go up the income scale through the middle class substantially because it is important that you have a diversity of income ranges and uh, a, a diversity of kids that participate in the program. It's a pilot program. Uh, it does ramp up over time, relatively slowly. The idea here is to implement something to bring those preschool programs along with you, to improve the quality as we go along. It ramps up to 2,000 kids by 2018. Uh, after that, hopefully, we've kind of worked out the kinks, figured it out, and can then expand it further as it goes forward. It is fully funded. There's a modest property tax levy that's involved in funding that program. That differentiates it significantly from the alternative program that has no funding attached to it. That alternative program is also very diffuse and broadly based. Um, so that program creates mandates, substantial mandates on the city that have a very high cost without any kind of funding to support them. This program is targeted at three and four year olds. It ramps up slowly over time and is fully funded. Um, I'll leave it at that. Holly, you want to say a few things about the program in the last minute? Yeah, and then we'll just open up. I could just time. make a couple of, of points. We're not the first people to do this, thank goodness. So we've had the benefit of learning from uh, Boston, New Jersey, Georgia, Oklahoma, Denver, uh, West Virginia, among others. I think even Washington, D.C. at this point has started. And what you'll see in our detailed consultant study is uh, a real close examination of the best practices and results from those programs. And so what we've tried to do in this work is glean from all of that work what really made a big difference in terms of student outcomes and incorporate that into this program. Great. Great. So we'll
open up to follow-up questions. Is there two different answers? Do people have questions for the campaign? Actually, I have a, this is just sort of a technical question. I understand that um, ballot language currently, sort of a general question about whether you support pre-K, and then it's either one or the other. And I know that's currently being appealed, and so we're actually going to be <laughs> voting in the alternative of four recommendations we'll make, just in case one or the other. But what does the first question say? Is it just, do you like teaching little yeah, kids? Right. The first question <laughs> is the threshold question. Do you support the city of Seattle setting for pre-K? I, I, I don't have the exact language in front of me, but it's essentially a threshold. Do you support I don't think that there is going to be a significant issue there. I think in the city of Seattle, there is very strong support for the idea of creating a preschool plan. There are some, you know, there's some anti-tax folks and whatever that that will oppose it, but, but uh, um, generally, I, I'm not that concerned about it. And then the second test, the second part of the question is saying, Regardless of whether you support one or the other, or, or whether you support the idea of creating a system, which of these two plans do you support that gives a description of both? And just very quickly, let me give you the, the, the reason for that. So the state RCWs governing municipal elections says that when you have two initiatives that fundamentally address the same subject, they are required to be placed on the ballot in this way. That, that is this two-part test, and you support the idea, and then which of them you prefer. Because, um, assuming they both pass, if you had to say they were on there separately, assuming they both pass, um, and there are differences between these two proposals, but there is such a substantial overlap, there is enough overlap, that invariably it will then end up in court, and then it will be a legal proceeding trying to determine, well, they contradict each other in fundamental ways, and how do you resolve that fundamental contradiction. So that's the, uh, that's the, I think, the rationale behind the, the state language about how they're required to be put on the ballot. The city council followed that. The, our opponents sued the city, saying they didn't agree that they addressed the same subject. A King County judge um, heard that case and weighed in and said the city, the city is right that they do address the same subject. So that is on appeal right now, but, um, uh, but uh, our argument is that they substantially overlap and conflict in the places where they overlap, and that's why. So, um, and I haven't read this very deeply, but you mentioned something that, is this a sort of a public-private partnership then with the pre-K? It sounded like it was public pre-K and public subsidizing these private I, I don't know that I'd call it a public-private partnership. I mean, we have a private pre-K system now. Right, so, you know, we have a public K-12 system, there's a private system now. Um, what this does is it creates a set of public standards, and if you want to participate in those public standards and get the public benefits, which include the subsidy for the parents, you have to meet what the, what the public expects of you. And that means, um, you know, providing quality pre-K. Uh, Holly, you have to jump so, in. So, yeah, no, this is, you know, the, the whole preschool industry is in many ways a cottage industry. Um, it's never really been organized at the federal, state, or local level. And we know that it would be folly to come in um, on top of this system and try to impose order or set of standards that are involved. Because people have worked for many years to set programs up and track and serve kids. This program is entirely voluntary. And we, we, what we say is it's a mixed delivery system in the sense that um, all kinds of providers can choose to participate. Private, public, uh, currently subsidized programs like Head Start, ECAP, the state program, can decide that they want to meet these standards and participate in this. And by the way, the federal and the state standards are moving in this direction anyway. ECAP, for example, in next year will be expanding their programs to six hour. Days. Um, so uh, I think it's fair to sort of think about it in the context of all the kinds of different, different models that are out there and all of them will be eligible to apply if they can meet these things. Does that make sense? Thanks for your question. So Liz and there? Uh, I see that the priority will be given to providers that do X and Y. Or do you have a formal application system that you're modeling after in Boston or New Jersey? to utilize, to get these 
players in the door and providers? We are, we are looking at both Boston, we looked at both Boston, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., Denver, and in our implementation plan, we will be putting together the actual process by which they will come and apply and get in. But in our plan, we've already detailed what the contracting priorities are, and um, those are for the initial classrooms to really work with our lowest income, um, both two things. Uh, students who are in districts, or in parts of the city where the kids are not performing well in school. So we're very concerned about really uh, addressing those. But also, it's a mixed income system. So for example, let's say um, uh, you wanna, you're very concerned about a school service area in Southeast Seattle. You still want the preschool classrooms in that area to be open to all incomes, and that's why we have the sliding scale to attract mixed income children. And it's to Melissa's point, kids do better in mixed income classrooms, and that's one of the strongest evidences from the research that we've seen. So it's a, it's been a real interesting process to figure out how we're going to plow these contracts. And and to piggyback on what Elizabeth was asking about a private public partnership, which I realized said is not quite the phrase to utilize. You're only going to be utilizing existing providers that are private providers, or is the city itself going to have some, utilize something from a public school system? If this public school system wants to participate, they can. Okay. We're very aware of the space constraints that they are operating in. So in the short term, they may be somewhat constrained in what they can do because of exactly what Melissa was laying out. Uh, but we would encourage them to, to apply and participate as they have space and, and ability to do so. And many preschool providers currently are religious based. Are you allowing the religious based to occur? Yes. Uh, as as well? they, they may, but for, to participate, they need to create uh, 501c3s, nonprofit organizations, that, and they're not allowed to proselytize uh, during the program. If they're getting public funds, but that's true for Head Start. Okay, so Mary and then Jack. Um, you've mentioned standards, and standards could have to do with the teachers, the students, the spaces, all kinds of things. Could you be more specific, please? Yes, and I can give you more details. I can give you more detail because we have standards for all of those things. For example, class size will be uh, a maximum of 20 students with two with a teacher, a lead teacher, and a Although uh, we also allow for uh, expanding that teacher uh, student ratio if you have uh, a significant number of kids who are special ed eligible, et cetera. Um, so we also will be looking at um, uh, standards for the organization of the classroom, the amount of materials, uh, the quality of the classroom. We will be using the state. Um, quality rating system, are you guys familiar with that? It's a new system that is rating classrooms across the state um, for how they, uh, how well designed they are and how well they're operating on a scale of one to five. Preschool. Yes, preschool. And um, our benchmark, our start, we have to be at least a three in our program to qualify to participate in this program. Um, and we will also have standards for teacher training and teacher credentialing and for assistant teacher credentialing. And if you just go down all the things you mentioned, we've got standards outside. Uh -huh. Is there a particular curriculum or are there simply guidelines? We have not uh, selected a particular curriculum, curriculum yet, but we will and we'll be discussing with our providers the kinds of qualities they want to see in a curriculum and the evidence behind it. Um, and then we will be providing training in that group. Right, and I think that that last point is is a key point here. What this program also provides is substantial funding to help participating teachers uh, meet the standards, to get the training that they need. All of that is funded as part of the program. It's not just a subsidy for families so that their kids can afford to participate. It's, it also includes funding to help those participating teachers um, uh, Develop the skills that they need. Tuition support. Yeah. To go back to college. That's right. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> 
a couple of yes no questions to be quick and then maybe longer. So um, you talked about uh, the religious uh, schools or other private sectors. Will they be um, required to follow the non discrimination policies in all ways that the city handles? Absolutely. Okay. And um, do you know if these preschools have to be NIAC certified or no? We're not using NIAC, we're using the state HCR. The state system? Yeah. Okay. But it's fine if they are. We love that. But right. we but it's want a hard and high standard. standard. It's a hard and high standard. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what about the, um, how are you going to, this is more of a longer piece, how are you going to allow for um, the uh, special needs issues? So with a with child who's three who may be aphasic or autistic, yeah. we can work with special services. How are you going to work that into this to allow for kids who may be on a special ed plan or so that's a very good question. So there are several different ways we're dealing with that. One is we will staff up if a classroom has a combination of, uh, of more than of six kids who are either dual language on the state welfare system or uh, have our special ed. And um, we, will, we also will be doing screenings, developmental screenings to determine if kids have these issues. And then we are developing a MOU with the school district, which provides those special ed services to make sure those services get directly into those classrooms. And we will be very bad about that. So that's something we're very concerned about. Did you have a quick follow-up, Jenna? Yes. Yeah. You're, you're um, shifting, so I thought <laughs> <more. laughs> so I, I, I know I'm cramming a lot of questions in my time. Um, so you talk about developmental screens. What about um, I know with Head Start they do mental health, they bring mental health consultants in, children's yes. home society does a lot of that. We so will have that capacity. Yes, that's built into the budget. So those are my questions. Thank you. Um, so I know that there's a lot of data collection that's involved in this, and um, is the data that's collected is it can it be attributed to a particular individual? No. And I, we have a lot of, Melissa knows, we spent a lot of time talking about this. We have a long history of working with the school district on data sharing agreements where we deal with de identified data. And we use that to actually track how kids are doing under the families and education levy, to find out whether the investments the citizens are making in those schools are really yielding results for kids. Um, so we don't know the names of children. But we do know whether or not the kids that we're investing in are actually making progress. And this birth, this uh, data system that's connecting these different elements of the educational system that Melissa referred to will help us inform preschools um, whether the kids that they serve are actually doing well when they take the walk kids assessment in, in kindergarten and then it, how they're doing in second and third grade. Because we feel it's imperative to give that feedback loop of information around the quality of outcomes for kids that are being served by this program. You can't go back and check for, well, let's see how Gary Scott is. No. Now, in areas, sometimes in the levy programs, we have gotten permit, correct permission and we're able to look at an uh, uh, individual student data, but that's only a parents group. We've never done it. I mean, we, can, we can't, we don't have the capacity. Um, when I looked at the, uh, the schedule of payments that would be required, both, both going across, and I only did one line across and one line down, but the numbers skipped around an awful lot, and I was puzzled by that. So, uh, I heard your question about yeah. that earlier. Uh, the main, there were two major principles we were, well, three. One, uh, the city of Boston has a free universal, they're working for a universal free K program, it's free. And ideally, that would be what happens here. Um, we can't afford that right now in the city, we don't think. And so, uh, in this, in this uh, subsidy, what you will see is that all children um, up to 300, from families up to 300% of poverty are yeah. free. And then we had a lot of evidence from our researchers about the middle class trough. So uh, families in the middle class are, are really uh, feeling the impacts of the economic recession. Wages have not increased. And we wanted to make sure we deeply subsidize middle class families as well. 
So after you get to that point, you start to see the subsidies reduce. Everybody gets a subsidy. So it's not a straight line, you're exactly right. Well, it, it, it didn't go steadily down or steadily up. It just jumped all over. It was very weird. Well, I'd be glad to take a look take at it if you have to this. Yeah, and, and I'll be you know, looking at more columns and rows because uh, it could be just the ones I picked, but it, it was, I would describe it as bizarre. There was one that was 500 and then the next one was 1,300. I'd have to look at since. Specifically yeah. what you're talking about, I'd be happy to do that with you. Mm -hmm. So we are about out of time. If you guys want to take about 30 seconds for <laughs> yeah. the second. Well, I'll just, so I, I love the, the questions here because they were so policy focused, but there's actually a political campaign here. <laughs> and nobody like sort of jumped into the meat of the, 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 the there's a political fight. We have two, you know, it is a oppositional campaign situation. People are going to have to choose between two proposals. So if I can't try to take, I only have 20 seconds, I guess, but. We can also talk in formal hours for that. Yeah, I mean, so this program is a pilot program. It starts off small, very deliberately. It builds up over time. It allows us to see work out the and it is funded. The other program does contain very significant mandates. It is very widespread. With those mandates, it includes no funding whatsoever or training or any of the stuff that is included in this. Stop there. There's, there's more to talk about about the differences, but. Right. Well, <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>